So today is St. Lucy's Day and that's the day when the saint brings light to people's houses. St. Lucy was um, an early Christian figure. Here in Austria we don't really have any great traditions around the day but in Scandinavian countries, you might be familiar with some of these St. Lucy celebrations, which are very, very beautiful. I thought we could use the day to talk a little bit about light. Um, back in time, before the calendar shifted to the Gregorian calendar, today was the day of the winter solstice. And this is why St. Lucy's Day developed into this kind of festival. Of course today it's a bit earlier so we're still heading into darker days but I think these days we're actually quite lucky with the options that we have these many many different kinds of lamps and lights that illuminate our homes and the streets and that can help us a little bit when our mood is down during these days. And I figured, let's go back in time to the beginning of artificial light. We know, of course, that light's always been important in people's houses. So we have light from Roman times, from antiquity, these here are portable and hanging metal oil lamps from the 17th and 18th century. So during a time when there were already first experiments with artificial light. Specifically during the 17th century, the German physicist Otto von Gerke is credited with producing the first man-made electric light in the middle of the 17th century, around 1660. He did that with a revolving sulfur-filled glass glove, which, when rubbed against with a cloth, produced sparks of static electricity. About 50 years later, it was improved by Francis Hauxby. And you could say that they basically created the world's first proto-neon light. Of course, from 1700, it did take a while before we got anything mass produced. But this is basically what this machine looked like. An electrical machine from 1730, a type of apparatus first devised by Otto von Gericke. The first types of light that were more commonly used were arc lighting. So what we have here is that uh, this type of electric discharge apparatus did not have a filament like we would have in a light bulb today. But rather it relied instead upon two carbon rods placed very close to one another but not touching. The electric current sparked across the small gap to form an arc of glowing vapor, while the carbon points, becoming white hot, produced a dazzling light. So we have a photo here of one of these early arc lights. This is the Holmes arc lamp from the South Foreland Lighthouse of the coast of Kent, England, around 1860 to 1880. And you can see these two rods placed very closely next to one another. And here you would have this spark of bright white light. However, the inherent problem of regulating the gap between carbon electrodes meant that arc lighting often had a variable intensity and could be unreliable in operation. 
So there was one problem. The other issue was that our gliding had an almost blinding luminosity, which meant that it was completely unsuitable for use in domestic environments. However, you could of course use it in the context of street lighting or in a lighthouse as we've just seen. And in fact, uh, the technology is still used today in some contexts. Here we have the electric arc lighting in Madison Square, New York, drawn by Charles Graham for Harper's Weekly on the 14th of January, 1882. We can see the horse carriages here in the back and in the foreground. We can see the 19th century fashion here and these ladies with a big hat a police officer the sir here walking with a cane But of course for our domestic settings we needed something else We needed one of these, a light bulb, an incandescent lamp. You're probably familiar with Thomas Edison, but there was another inventor, Joseph Swan, who I think was in fact a little earlier with his light bulb. This is his first incandescent lamp, presented in Newcastle in December 1887. You can see here this is quite an elongated light bulb with a filament at the center and a rather large structure altogether compared to today's lights we're gonna have a closer look at that in a moment but first let's have a look at this New Year's poster from Puck magazine in 1880 and you can see here how much that really changed the world. What we have at the center illuminating the world from the North Pole is Edison's light bulb. It says here Edison's endeavor. We have the big light bulb. It looks a little like it's smiling. It says a new light to the world with 1880 being born as a little fat baby and 1879 leaving the globe as an old man here in the bottom we have 1878 77 76 it's almost a little macabre down here we can see the moon that goes into morning because the light's too bright at night we have up here the northern lights, pack the lays and move on with this cute little bear here looking out towards the bright city here and we have the total eclipse of the sun by the earth so I think it really must have been very impressive at the time to suddenly see all this artificial light moving to people's homes. Here we have Thomas Edison with a few of the Menlo Park boys from 1878, so people that he worked with. But we're gonna skip ahead a little. Light. 
neon sign from the 1930s something that we probably also associate with a later time See here street lights in Paris with the Eiffel Tower in the back and the bridge there must be quite new for the time. It says here 1897. All right, so this is what we were looking for. We have again. Joseph Spawn's first incandescent light bulb from 1878 and here on the left hand side we have Joseph Spawn in his laboratory at Holland Park in London at around 1900. So he says here that Joseph Spawn became captivated with the idea of producing the first practical incandescent light bulb after he heard some reports about it. And in 1848, so quite a bit earlier, after three years of experimentation, he perfected the carbonization of thin strips or spirals of paper and card that had been soaked in syrup, treacle or tar, and then heated in a mass of powdered charcoal. The resulting carbonized filaments were thin yet flexible, but any residual trace of air left in the glass bulb caused them to break down quickly. It was only after Hermann Sprengel's invention of the mercury vacuum pump in 1865 and William Crookes perfecting of vacuums while developing his radiometer in 1875 that Swan and his colleague Charles Stern were able to achieve the sufficient vacuum required to make the first practical light bulb based on the incandescent principle in December 1878. So there were 13 years between perfecting the right kind of filament and actually being able to produce this kind of light bulb. He then presented it at a lecture at the Chemical Society of Newcastle upon Tyne. However, he did not apply for a patent because he assumed that it was already um, basically in public. The other person who did file for a pattern was Thomas Edison. We have a picture here experimenting in his Menlo Park laboratory in the 1880s. Quite a lot of powders and chemicals here in the back. We kind of love his outfit, the very formal suit with the waistcoat and the bow tie and then he's clearly been working quite a lot by the looks of his trousers. But he was clearly more occupied with his work than with his look and rightly so. So this is what his light bulb looked like. It's the carbon filament incandescent light bulb from about 1880. And here we can see Edison's application for pattern for paper carbon. In figure one, which we have here, we can see a vertical section of the lamp complete. Figure 2 is the side view on large size of the clumping device. Sorry, this would be figure 2. So the clumping device. 3 is the section of the line in still large size. 4 is the wire forming one of the clumps before it's bent up to shape. 5 is the paper blank before it's carbonized and 6, finally down here, is a section of the box. So the important part is that there was only a small residual amount of oxygen in the bulb, which 
meant that even though the filament became very hot, it could not catch fire. The issue with the light bulb was that it could still not be used by the masters because of course you needed quite a lot of infrastructure. You needed electricity, you needed to be able to actually produce these lamps. So Edison spent a lot of his money on producing um, these materials and making sure that the infrastructure existed. And then quite quickly, many different kinds of lamps began to exist. Like this combination bracket and portable table or wall light from the 1890s. Or two portable desk lights. This one could be changed in height. And then people quickly began to play with forms. Yes, somewhere between Art Nouveau and Art Deco. You have these elaborate floral designs here. For a pendant lamp from the ceiling, a chandelier. This one looks quite cute, don't you think? I like that. A hanging light, a metal shade with leaded glass insert. also have these figures with three light bulbs on top. This is from 1900. You could have a dragonfly chandelier. This one's from France. Or maybe if you lived in a neo-gothic castle, you could get yourself one of these bad chandeliers for the right kind of atmosphere. Personally, I got this book because I still need some lampshades for a few of my rooms. And I thought I could look for some inspiration for what kind of shades I do like. I am a little overwhelmed, I have to say. And this is only the first part. There's another one with more modern versions. So I think I'll go and study a couple more of these and consider my options. for today. We're gonna leave it at that. I'll turn off these little lights and I'll wish you a good night and I'll see you again tomorrow.